Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Laurie Gilman. I'm the owner of East City Bookshop, and we are so happy to have you here tonight. I have to use my notes because I'm a little rusty on, <laughs> on the event still. Um, just want to make sure I get all the housekeeping things. How many of you have been here before? Oh, just a couple of people. Okay, well, we're always happy to have people return, but we're also thrilled to have new people here, and we hope that we will see you again for shopping, for events. We hope that you'll sign up for our e-newsletter, um, which will tell you about all the events coming up. And uh, we are also on all the social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So if you're on any of those, look for us there as well. We put all our event stuff out there. Um, and then just a couple of more details. If you have not yet purchased a book and you would like to do that after the event, they are uh, on the table right over there. You do have to pay upstairs at the registers and then you can bring it back down for signing. Um, and restrooms are also upstairs to the left toward the back of the upstairs part of the store. I think that's all the housekeeping. So tonight's book, Brown Enough, I'm really excited about this event. This book is a powerful and passionate examination of claiming your space and being seen, of demanding to be seen despite the dominant narrative that we have that is framed by whiteness. After the discussion, we'll have an opportunity for questions um, from the audience, including our online audience. And I do want to acknowledge that we have a virtual audience tonight. Welcome to all of you. Um, we're happy that you can be here with us as well. And if our online audience has any questions, you can put that in the Q&A. And our tech person, Emma, right here, will read it and we will get your question answered. Okay, let's see. That is everything on that front. So on to the main event. I'm pleased to welcome Christopher Rivas, who is not only an author, but also a podcaster, storyteller, and an actor. And you can currently see him on the Fox series, Call Me Cat. Christopher is a PhD candidate in expressive arts for global health and peace building at the European Graduate School. And he's a Rothschild Social Impact Fellow. In conversation with Christopher this evening is Myra Macias. She's currently the Chief Strategy Officer at Building Back Together, where she leads political strategy and policy engagement for the organization, which focuses on building support for the Biden-Harris administration's policy agenda. Meyer has been a force in national politics for more than a decade, beginning with Obama's 2012 campaign. She has done a lot of other things in national politics, and it's quite, um, it's been quite a 10 years for the last 10 years for her. And I think some more of those things will come up in the conversation. So I am going to go on to the authors who are the people you actually want to hear talking. Please help me welcome Christopher and Myra. Hi, everyone. Hi, 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 hi. Uh, love the yellow sweater. Uh, plug for Christopher's merch. Yeah, everyone look back at that sweater. You can get that online. Check it out. Um, Chris, welcome to D.C. Welcome to the nation's capital. Thank you. It's How's D.C. treating here. you? American. Feels good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, but I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm sure as you were hearing the bios, you were like, wow, this is an interesting pairing. But we are a stone's throw away from the Capitol, and no other place is representation more relevant than in the halls of Congress and in politics. So before we get into um, discussing the book, and we'll hear Chris read uh, from, from the book, I wanted to first congratulate you all, uh, or congratulate Chris. Um, his book is in the second printing. Can you explain to us what that means? Yeah, this happened as of yesterday uh you get an initial print of books we sold that print and uh the publisher started a second printing uh, which means if you can get the book today which you can uh it is a very good time to get the book uh because 
it'll be a it'll be a wait before the second one arrives. Uh, so it is it is a good and it is bad. But but get the book, get one for your friend, get one for a brown person or an unbrown person in your life as a gift. That's right. Round of applause. He sold the first print. Um. So I I wanted to start with why you wrote the book. Just give us a little insight as to to what prompted you to write this book. Yeah. You like it. She like <laughs> she likes this prompt. Uh I went to see Tana. Uh we all know what Tana Hasi Coates is. His books are most likely in here. Also great books for purchase. Uh great thinker, man, writer, philosopher. And I saw him in a setting not much larger than this. And he was speaking about race in America, black and white as he often does. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, well, as a Dominican Colombian brown kid from Queens, where does that leave me in the conversation? And he said, not in it. And I don't think he said it in a way of like, I'm angry, you're wrong. Like, it was just like, in this black and white world, we do not have space for the middle. In this he, she world, right? Look at gender right now. And they, and people's upsetness and confusion we don't have room for the middle the binary the fluidness the culturally fluid even though that's what the world is and so i went home after that moment sort of shattered and i said where am i right where's maida where's a lot of the people in here where's my where's my pops where's my mom where's my building where's most of queens like where is the middle space and uh it was enough to make me write a whole book it was enough to make me blow up my whole life and and write everything down and what was born was was this baby yeah amazing yes <laughs> sorry I thought you were going. um okay so the, the the next question i had brown enough obviously there are latinos that identify as white or black or afro latino why did you choose brown enough instead of latinx latino latine enough it is a personal story. So there is my Latin A X E ness in it, you know, like, uh, but it goes way beyond Latinidad ness. First of all, you can't embody 24 countries and hips and flavors inside of a box. You can't. In a census, there will never be a form that can contain us. And that means everyone in this room, I, I really believe, like we are uncontainable in a box and yet they try and put us in a box. And so when I chose brown, brown was the idea of me. What does it look like to live larger, even than just Latinidad? What does it look to examine what it's like to live under the gaze of whiteness, but also under the gaze of capitalism and also under the gaze, you know, all of these gazes that have told me what to do, how to be, how to dress, how to sound, where to go, all the mathematics we have to do as bodies of culture just to exist, just to breathe. Uh, and so brownness goes way beyond color, right? Yes, it's a color, like literally it's of the earth, right? Uh, brown sienna comes from the mountains. It comes from the dirt. So it's in our survival. So brownness is literally a color, but it's also, it's also what it, I, I really believe in this culturally fluid awakening, this middle space. And there's more brownness in the world than anything else. Straight up, truly. Uh, and so what does it look like to really see and embrace those shades? uh each one of them individually as enough and that's a world i'd like to live in who so given that it's not just for latinos like who is your target audience who do you want to read this book honestly kids like this should be high school essential reading <laughs> like real talk i mean all of y'all yes uh but I, I just found out this fact and it's blowing my mind. 49% of millennials identify as multiracial. 51% of Gen Zers identify as multiracial. We are culturally fluid. Oh, it's happening. It's here. It's not like it is here. It is here. It is here. And it's so beautiful. So it's for them. And then last night I was telling you, I did an event and it's really blowing my mind. Iowa has a law, House Law 504 that says teachers are not allowed to talk about bias or prejudice in the classroom. And so this teacher asked me, well, how do I show up for my brown kids? How do I show up for them? This, 
it, this I want them to read this. They need this. They need this. So who's it for? It's 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 for everyone. Yeah, it's for everybody. All the colors, all the shades. Um, but the dedication in the book, when you open the first words of this book, are I dedicate this to all the little brown kids who need to see themselves grander and more vibrant, but don't. I see you. I hear you. We hear. All right. Well, now we're gonna go to reading. <laughs> we uh, this is on the fly, y'all. Chris doesn't know what he's getting into, so <laughs> bear with him. Um, all right. My favorite chapter was the real James Bond was Dominican. Really? Yeah, it was my favorite chapter. Wow. Um, also another plug, Chris has a great podcast called Ruby Rosa that y'all should listen to. I know there are a couple fans here and that's how they got introduced to your work. But in this chapter, you talk about Porfirio Ruby Rosa, who's, you know, one of your heroes, right? Here in all ways. Yes. Like hero and warning. All right. Yeah. So he um, actually I have a follow up question to that. <laughs> Your own warning. Let's let's sit with that. So you talk about Ruby Rosa. You talk about your time in Hollywood and just like what the industry has forced you to do. And I like honestly, it was so vulnerable and so honest when you talk about like chopping off your beautiful curly hair and talk about getting a nose job. That wow, like incredible so I was wondering especially in the industry that you're in a lot of people don't share intimate details of their life like that what prompted you to divulge all that information I, I, I don't know why it's always just been easier for me to like give it all uh we've all seen the matrix right like waking up no I don't not, not, I don't want to like this ain't a, this is a safe space. Let me not but like great movie. Like uh it's hard to wake up. It's hard to wake up. It's hard to unplug. Like it's a lot of work. And we have so much braided into us. And so at some point in my life, I decided that if I really wanted to be free and I really wanted to wake up, I needed to be honest for better and for worse. I needed to be honest with myself. And one of the ways I could be honest with myself is if I was honest with others. And I happened to make art about my life. And I am a big fan of James Baldwin. James Baldwin changed my life. Love James Baldwin. Uh, truly changed my life. And I felt like he showed up. I felt like he didn't hold back. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice changed my life. I felt like he showed up. I felt like he didn't hold back. Um, and so I have so many ancestors and teachers who have shown up with everything. And I wanted to, I wanted to match that. Uh, and it has allowed me each time. It allows me to get a little closer to myself. I think there's like uh, there's, this is who we want to be. And then the other hand is who we are. And then the space in the middle is all the work we have to do to meet. And so I think when I, when I get honest in this way, I get closer to meeting myself. Can you bless us with a reading now? Yeah. On page 163. <laughs> We're on this journey together, y'all. Where are we going? <laughs> Everyone always wants to uh t tell me what the questions are gonna be. And I'm always like, no, 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 don't tell he me. Didn't want to Can prep I tell for you? This. <laughs> but she was really like, all right, I got you. All right, 163. I'm here. Uh when I was considering, and then wherever, wherever your heart tells you to stop. All right, cool. When I was considering the surgery. It was because my white manager at the time swore it would help. She told me to go away somewhere, leave LA for a month to get the surgery, heal and recover. She insisted, Rivas, everybody does it. It's not a big deal. For the record, I have an amazing Latino manager now. You know who you are. I asked my parents what they thought. They didn't disagree. I made up some excuse to my partner at the time, who I was also living with, about having to suddenly go away for a month. Family stuff, I told her. Too embarrassed to admit what I, what I was doing that it was erasing a part of my face, a part of where I come from. I left, changed, and after a month, I came home to LA and I started booking work left and right. I now had evidence that looking more Eurocentric allowed me more mobility. Nothing had changed but my features. My acting skills were the same. My nose was simply thinner. I was closer to success due to embracing the Eurocentric ideal, and this made me feel further away from both success and myself. 
Success feels counterfeit when you need to look and act a certain way to get it. Even now, to this day, post-surgery, I still pinch my nose in the shower before a meeting, before an audition, before a date, on my way somewhere, in the car, today, tonight. While I'm writing this, I grab my nose between index finger and thumb and I pull it forward. A friend of mine called me out on it during a coffee date. Why do you always do that thing to your nose? I replied, it's just a habit. It's just the thing I picked up along the way. But what I could have said was, it's because I've been brainwashed. It's a fear and a trauma that is instilled deep within me, an ancient wound, a separation that secretly, not so secretly, makes me wish and need to look more like you. I mean, I wanted to hit Chris to share that because that that broke me. So many of us growing up in Latino neighborhoods and really like people of color who have internalized a lot of self-hate and to just read it and you were so vulnerable. Um, it, it was truly breaking, but I'm glad that you put it out there. I have this uh, moment in this, uh, I have a play. It's, it's in the real James Bond was Dominican. And uh, I have a moment in the play where I take out a clothespin and everyone has a clothespin in their seat. They don't know, but it's hidden there. And uh, we ask people, you know, we just, we talk about it. And, and then I asked the audience, how many of us have been called big nose by someone we love? It becomes a joke in so many cultures and families. Where does that joke come? Like that joke precedes them and us and it's not funny. And yet we laugh and they laugh and, you know, and so many people are hit by that one moment. And the nose pinching thing I've had at this point, hundreds and hundreds of people come up to me saying, hey, my grandma told me to do that. My mom told me to do that. You know, I'm Trinidadian and I was told to do that. I'm Ecuadorian. I'm this. And I was told to do that. Like, yeah. I want to go back to something you said earlier. What did you say? A hero and a warning. Yeah. So, um. We said, Porfirio Rubirosa, hero and warning. And I'm actually glad you preface it that way because I, I, so for those who don't know, Porfirio Rubirosa worked for uh, Trujillo, who was a Dominican dictator. I <laughs> see some, <laughs> yes, very visceral reaction, who um, committed genocide against the Haitian community in the DR, rooted in anti Blackness. Chris does an incredible job of giving Rubirosa nuance you highlight and call out his wrongs, but also humanize him in a way that makes you empathize with him. Like you, you show him as a full person. And I just wanted to know if you feel torn ever about putting someone, I don't, not necessarily on a pedestal, but, you know, bringing awareness to this man who's clearly a flawed person um, who willingly or unwillingly was part of, you know, systematically oppressing a whole community of people and how you grapple with that tension. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't have difficulty seeing someone honestly, meaning like I can appreciate you and I can also see the warnings of what I should not become. That's also that binary thinking we can hold two opposing ideas in the mind and in the body at the same time. The delusion is that we have to only feel one way about a person or a thing. You know, you can get mad at someone you love and still love them and be genuinely upset with them. And being honest about that is okay. And so with Ruby Rosa, there's a, you know, the book Shantaram, you can also probably get that here, Sam, buy all these books. <laughs> I think like, that's three now. That's that, three yeah. people have to get. Uh, in Shantaram, he writes, there comes a moment in everyone's life when you meet someone who shows you exactly what you should can become or exactly what you should avoid becoming. Ruby Rosa was both for me. He was exactly what I was becoming and how I could lose myself in becoming that. He was someone who was so obsessed with being seen and desired and loved. And it, and it literally drove him to his death. He did anything for that. And I felt that. I felt that very presently in me. Uh, 
and so and so that's why it is not hard for me to call him out on his shit and to call him out on his humanity because i got my own shit and i got my own humanity and we're all doing our best that's right more readings from chris uh page 96 <laughs> Uh, this chapter is the cost of pretending also great chapter i'm just picking all the the things that really triggered me so <laughs> bear with me you're just here for my uh therapy session <laughs> um so would love for you to start reading at angry at parents and just to give a little context um in this chapter chris is reckoning with a lot of um just personal familial issues Am I giving you the right one? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. I'm just, I'm just okay. Just reading ahead of and so we know. I think it, and the reason why I say it's triggering is because there's so many of us who are actively trying to fight generational traumas that have been passed on to our families. Um, and I'm going to let Chris read the chapter and then follow up with the question, but wanted to give some of that context before he reads. I used to be angry at my parents wondering why they seemed to let go of their past. I thought that they believed that in order to get ahead, something must be left behind. I thought they weren't proud of where they came from. Now I know better. I am no longer mad. I think my parents did what so many brown Americans are forced to do, assimilate and pretend in hopes of possibility for their kids so they don't have to watch them go hungry. Assimilation or pretending or whatever you want to call it, it's not a thing to condemn. The need to assimilate into another culture to avoid discrimination and achieve advancement is pretty universal for any outsider. It's a part of the overarching, vaguely defined American Black, Brown, and Indigenous experience. Now, I thank them. Because for better or worse, I learned how to navigate this America in a body of color. It is a necessary and valuable skill, and I have learned well. But where they did, but where they did it just to get by... I do it in the hopes of getting ahead. I'm not less, and my parents didn't let go of anything on purpose or because they were done with their Latinidad, because that's not true. I still went to a Colombian bakery every Saturday, followed by Don Francisco and Sabago Gigante that same night. We had the best Chino Dominicano food in Queens at least twice a month. I'm talking a bowl of wonton soup next to some killer Maduro and Mangu. My parents were simply building a life as best as they knew how. A good life. No, my home wasn't especially filled with flags of my parents' respective homelands, but it didn't have any flags for that matter. It wasn't decked out in Santeria or Rishas or Shun or rosary beads. There weren't maracas lying around. It was just a home. We ate rice and beans, but we also ate a lot of frozen tortellini and a lot of pastrami on rye from the corner diner that knew all of our names and never handed us a menu because we knew it by heart. Walking into a place and being known is something my father takes significant pride in. My parents did salsa dance a lot, and that was fucking glorious. My father floated and my mother levitated. They both shined. Watching my parents dance was like being taken to another time and another place. Dirty dancing Havana nights, except starring two brown people. Watching them do their thing was mesmerizing. They also danced the hustle a lot. They danced all the dances. They are kids of the disco era. They always had on music and they're always dancing. I learned a lot more from them than just another language or how to pretend and fit in. I learned about love and sacrifice. I learned rhythm. I learned how to properly scratch a record, Grandmaster Flash style, how to cook, how to be self-sufficient, how to dance, how to hustle, how to care. I learned how to be a New Yorker. I hold this in high regard because the city I grew up in is a big deal to me. My parents taught me that being a New Yorker means something a world apart from being brown, Dominican, Colombian, Afro-Latino, Afro-Taino, Caribbean, or American. We were New Yorkers. Round of applause that. Such beautiful imagery. I was transported to your living room, salsa dancing. Um, so the reason why I wanted- My living room was, <laughs> I gotta find y'all a picture. You see the red in that book up there? The Bell Hooks book? no oh i was thinking below it but yeah the bell hooks book too like it was red my parents living room was red like a watermelon exploded <laughs> like you walked in and you had this like red living room and that's where they always dance uh it was a very trip. stimulating yeah it was, yeah it was stimulating for sure um 
So in your podcast, you actually like bring your parents on yeah. to, to talk about some of the my dad's everyone's favorite person now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I want to meet Chris's parents. No offense to Chris, but your parents seem great. Um my madrina is watching virtually. So for those of us who uh, haven't confronted our family or like are in the process of confront and I say confronting lovingly, right? Because I think sometimes like our parents don't even know or family members don't even know that the, the trauma they've inflicted on us because it was inflicted upon them and they didn't know any better. So I just was wondering if you could share what that process was like of bringing your parents into conversation and like bearing it all out there in, in your, your mom was at your book event in Miami. I'm sure like, what's that process been like? The greatest process in the world. I am so close to my parents right now more than I've ever been because we're talking. And I think we forget as children that they don't have it figured out. They are doing their best. They don't have the answers. They're like doing their best. And so it does take two sides to tango. Like why in this moment in time, they have decided to be open enough in a public setting that thousands of people would listen to and read. I don't know, but I am beyond grateful that I took the time to ask them these questions, not out of place of like, I'm mad at you, but like, I want to know. I want to know why Lauren got to go to the DR and I, and I didn't. I want to know why when it came to me, you didn't make it a big deal for me to speak Spanish. I want to know what assimilation means to you. Pops, I want to know why you mark white on your license. I want to know these things. Not, I just, I really want to know. And then they, in the asking, also got to explore it themselves. Everyone is just doing their best. And I think we forget that as we move through the world, but especially our parents. And so my relationship to them now is better than it ever has been. Uh, because I, because they're people <laughs> like again, and, and like any good relationship, you get to keep meeting a person over and over again. And I get to keep meeting them over and over again. And so anyone, I would say, have that conversation with your parents, ask them a question really ask them that question. I'm going to ask one more question. And then in the meantime, please think of any questions you may have, because we're going to open it up to Q&A, including our folks watching virtually. You can type in your question. Um, I have to bring this chapter up because we're in DC and most folks in this room have probably been to a networking event where there's a lot of small talk uh, and you're put in a really uncomfortable situation because someone says something racist and you're debating whether or not, you know, do I expend energy and call them out? Or do I finish my free drink? Cause that's what I'm here for. I'm so Chris, do you mind actually reading that again, triggering for me <laughs> reading on page 56. You know, so great about this. I don't know what's on 56. <laughs> like, on. We're on this adventure together. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, please raise your hand if you've ever been in a situation where you're at a networking event and someone says something and you, I, I feel like there needs raise to be more high. hands. Yeah, raise a high. They're like a, like a quarter of this room. Uh, where would you like me to start? Uh, let's see. Hold on. Oh, the older I get. Oh, this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> this chapter's funny. This is a funny chapter. Like this you're is, discovering your book yeah, all over again. <laughs> this chapter is funny. Um, do I want to tell them what this chapter is called now or after? I think. Oh after. yeah. I think after. I'm gonna start two lines up if you don't mind. Go for it. <laughs> a week later, three. A couple lines up. I walked into their home in Venice and my skin started to crawl. Their home was trying too hard, way too hard. For one, there was an open concept rain shower in their living room with a glass bottom and top so you could be seen from both sides. I am not against nudity. I never wear a shirt and I rarely wear pants at home, but your shower doesn't need to be in your living room. Just getting water everywhere. 
There were large sculptures ubiquitously placed willy-nilly and the dining room table had these very large, uncomfortable black boxes for seats. I don't care how much money you have, a seat should be more comfortable than artistic. And if it is going to be art, make it comfortable art. I wasn't in the house for more than two minutes when they said this house had a scene in Point Break. Oh, cool, I replied. The older I get, the more difficult it is to engage in small talk or pretend that I like something or am impressed when I'm not. But worse than the decor was the lack of diversity. I've realized that the older I get, the more difficult it is to act like I comfortably fit in a room full of only white bodies. Right before we sat down to dinner, a tall and beautiful black woman walked in and apologized for being late. Her name was Alice, and I breathed a deeper breath than I breathed all night and thought, tight, maybe I won't get murdered. Or they needed one boy and one girl to sacrifice. Balance. At least I won't go out alone. Alice and I locked eyes at the pace in which the only two non-white people in a room lock eyes. Fast. Our host for the evening ordered cafe. Ordered cafe. <laughs> Not to pronounce that. <laughs> Our host for the evening ordered cafe gratitude for us. That's how you know I just came from Miami. That's exactly how you know. Cafe gratitude. Uh, our host for the evening ordered Cafe Gratitude for us, a vegan restaurant where all the food is called some sort of affirmation, which they make you say when you order it. Can I please have the I am magnificent and also the I am restored and she'll have the I am magical. But the it's true. It's the food is yummy. So no issue there. We're sitting down and everything is pleasant. The host has table games, ways to spark conversation and introduce one another. I can't tell you what led to this next comment, but our woke host who travels the world teaching mindfulness said the words, I don't believe anyone is more privileged than anyone else. Fuck. I just wanted to have dinner. <laughs> oh, it's triggering. I just wanted to eat this food and make boring small talk and go home and tell my friends about this very white dinner I just attended. But now, now I got to deal with this shit. Again, as fast as the only two people of color can make eye contact in a room, Alice and I made eye contact fast. I know we were both thinking the same things. Who's going to speak up? Should I? Will you? Do we have to? Why do we have to? Will someone else? What the fuck? Why were we invited to this? I was just trying to eat. Is it rude to take food to go? Maybe I let this one pass. Now I got to go and ruin the night and make it all awkward at this weird and uncomfortable postmodern table. I knew one of us had to say something, but I didn't want Alice to bear the burden. So I responded, excuse me, but you inherited wealth and privilege the moment bodies were stolen from their homes in order to give you this wealth, this food, this street corner, everything we stand on. You inherited privilege when someone made up that it was a better to be poor and white than poor and black. You can write all the books and do all the meditation retreats and give all the talks, but your body and your cells aren't around long enough for you to comprehend the bloodshed trauma and abuse that lets you stand here in all this privilege. I'm not really sure why it came out like a planned dissertation. <laughs> I wasn't seeking to expend some sort of emotional labor. Sometimes the words used in ignorance and privilege hurt. And I guess I just don't want to be hurt anymore. And then it got weird and awkward and quiet and heavy, thick, full, knife through the butter, quiet. Everyone was waiting for something or someone else to save the moment. I love it when you can feel the weight of time. When the clock is slower than it's been, like it's sitting on top of a hot stove. Our ho host avoided eye contact with me at all costs. She tried to save herself with the classic line, that's not what I meant. What do you mean, I asked. The husband stepped in and tried to take the energy away from her. Look, it's a misunderstanding, and I, th I think we need to let it breathe. We've been letting racism breathe for centuries, but sure, yeah, let's let it breathe, I said. The next 39 minutes were an attempt to support, not escalate, and maintain some sort of chill environment, also known as real small, small talk. And right before it looked like we could all escape this thing before people were crying, Alice spoke up and said, it is exhausting to teach. You know that, right? Why'd you say that? Why did none of you correct her? It's training. You should be ashamed of yourselves, all of you. It's not enough that we have to walk around constantly trying to grasp our own worth. No, now we have to teach you too. You write books, you have voices, use them. Round of applause. Wow. So triggering, so triggering. Um, how do you decide when to speak up and when to just conserve your energy? I think so much of like us being so brown people in these spaces is about survival and 
more often than not, like I could call them out or I could just keep living my life and like, you know, surviving. So I'm just so impressed that you did that also. What a, what a, what a great home, you know, (laughs) but very, very triggering. And I know many of us in this room have probably been in similar situations. Um, so just wanted to get your thought process on when you decide to speak up because there are multiple times in the book where you speak up and call people out. Yeah. So that chapter is called the water we swim in, uh, where I challenge that microaggressions aren't micro. It's just the water we swim in. We're all fish in toxic water. Whereas James Baldwin says, when you put one person in a cage, you put everybody in a cage. Nobody's free until we all free. Or you in some tea where you leave the tea bag in too long and it gets all nasty. The, the, we've been, we're all steep and we're all in tea. It's all the same tea. It's just the water we're swimming in. And in this water we're swimming in, bodies of culture often have to do that moment that I, that I reflected, which is the amount of mathematics, the questions. Who is this person? Who am I in this situation? What do I have to do? What should I say? Do I sound like this? Will this affect my livelihood? Ugh, what do I have the power? How far is home? What time is it? Like, we are constantly having to do the mathematics. We are the best mathematicians in the world. So give yourselves credit for that, but also how exhausting the energy that we expend in doing the internal mathematics just to exist. That said, I believe in disruption. I'm a big believer in it. It's not easy, but I believe in it. In order for one, you know, world, in order to be born into a new world, we must destroy another. Also, it's not your job to save the world. (laughs) Because we can hold two things in the mind at the same time, and that's okay. And so if you are tired, be tired. Walk away. Or if you are so tired that you are fed up, speak. But do not be mad at yourself if you walked away. And do not be mad at yourself if you spoke. Like, there's no right way. There's the truth. Ignorance is bliss until you've tasted bliss, and then the rest is just ignorance. I like the taste of bliss. For me, bliss is speaking my truth. For me. But some days, I'm also tired. So I'm just like, I'm good. This is it's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's, I got, it's not worth it. It's like... And so there's no right or wrong way, but I, but I think, I think you have to be honest with yourself about where you are in this process of getting free. Just be honest about where you are in this process of getting free and don't beat yourself up about where you are in that process. Cause also at the end of the day, like if you got to put food on the table and this is going to fuck up, you putting food on the table then you got to put food on the table. Also real talk, you know, you'll know where you are in the moment. I want us to sit with, be honest about the process you are in. I'm butchering your line, the process (laughs) Um, you're in becoming free. So folks sit with it. We're now opening it up to Q and A from the audience. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, ask away. Don't be shy. Chris has poured his whole life. (laughs) We're all friends now. Carlos. asking a lot of questions, they're very open to you. But like one thing is them giving their perspective to you, but another is like them being comfortable about like sharing your parts of the story. How did you navigate that? Because like I was taught like I'm also like I share a lot of my stories with my friends where they say like mm-hmm. but, like they don't want to they don't want me to share their part, which is I obviously respect. So how did you navigate that? And we have to repeat the question. So I will summarize as Chris yeah, yeah. thinks of an answer. Um, I'm going to summarize by saying that Carlo said, we don't air our dirty laundry. And so how does Chris navigate pouring so much of himself, sharing so much of his family's stories uh, when sometimes your family isn't comfortable with you bearing it all? I think many years ago now, 
my father's ultimate joke to any woman I was dating was be careful because Chris is always listening. Like he going to write a play about it, you know, like, you know, because my father became the subject of my work early on in my work. Because he too is a, I mean, he's a master class in being a body of culture. He is. And uh, uh, so early, I think that happened, but still to this day, you know, like I was just, I just saw him in Miami and he was like, I might have to be quiet. He's going to tell everybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, But he says it as a joke because you know what? My dad has gotten free. love it my uh my pops has cried more times in the last like year than he cried in my whole life you know he has thanked me more times called me how you doing we've had like real conversations it's been really beautiful he's getting free air your dirty laundry you know like because the cupboards are always going to be everything you keep in that cupboard knows it's there it's going to be just gnawing at you always you know so if you can't share it you know and if you ain't ready that's fine but get free where are you at and getting free and it's it's not just my own freedom it's theirs too god my mom sent me a text message that was so beautiful like I hated who I was as a kid. I hated that my, that her mother, my grandmother, didn't want to learn English in this country that provided so many opportunities. I thought she was a bad example of what it meant to be American. You know, like she sent me this long, beautiful message. Thank you so much. Right? She got free. 62 years old, she got a little bit freer. Yesterday. <laughs> like, Every day we can get a little closer to ourselves, to this, right? Who we are, who we want to be. Till we get free, they don't meet. So that's 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 how it's happened with my parents, you know. Like, yeah, my dad's been a special one. That's yeah. Yeah. And thank you for doing that work of helping yourself find freedom but helping bring your family along the way because i know that's hard all right yes you yes <laughs> sorry i don't know your name <laughs> Woo! thanks eliana we're hosting them for uh, LinkedIn kind of month. So, uh, okay, LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my card afterwards. <laughs> you know, I've been texting the, the crew, and they're like, hi, right? So, Thank you. And they're like, you want to buy some brown enough shirts, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I got it. Um, but, but thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's, it's very touching. That story you just told about your parents. And I have two questions, but out of respect for everyone else, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the follow-up to that. I I I I relate to to the struggles that you had with your parents. I I think my my parents have a similar dynamic. Um, you know the, the way they were raised is much different with how I see the world now. And and you know there's a lot of self um, self hatred almost right within them. And I'm curious if if you had opened up to your parents, and and I'm glad they reacted the way they did. But what if they had reacted the opposite? Great I'm curious how, how you know what conversation we'd be having right now. Oh wait, we have to repeat the question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so the question is: Thankfully, Chris's parents reacted positively. Have been on this journey with him. What if they had not reacted that way, and in fact had a negative reaction to um, Chris bearing at all? And I don't know, right? Because this is my multiverse. Like, but in that multiverse, 
I imagine I would still be here getting free. Ignorance is bliss until you've tasted bliss and the rest is just ignorance. Like I still, whatever inspired me to ask the questions, y'all, this is a whole book about asking big fat questions. It's less about answers. I care less about answers in this life and I'm more driven towards asking fat, fat, scary questions. And like Rilke says, hopefully I can live myself into an answer. But we got to ask the question. Or a persistent problem is a proper question not yet asked. We got to ask the question. And so I think I would still be here if my parents reacted that way. I will say it wasn't immediately about them, the work. You start, you start small and then you're like, oh, but wait, I came from something. But oh, they came from something. But, uh, you know, like you, you, you follow the trail back to the source. Um, and I think there were moments when it was me work, right? Like when I was on a stage, like, you know, doing moth stuff or personal storytelling or teaching storytelling workshops. Like, you know, my dad's like, yo, you have to, you know, well, that's, this is funny. This is interesting, right? Like my pops is super like Santeria Dominican. Like, don't, don't be telling people shit. People are bad. They're going to wish bad luck on you. Like, don't tell nobody nothing. I always got that. Y'all laughing because you know, like, don't tell nobody. Don't tell real. nobody nothing. You know how hard that has been in relationships, like intimate relationships, because I could never trust a partner. Even good news, I couldn't share it with them because deep, don't tell nobody nothing. Until it happens, don't you tell nobody nothing. Just now he's starting to, you know, I was like, no, I'm going to tell people things. This is how I'm going to get, I got to tell, I'm going to tell them that's it, you know? And so, and so we, we sort of had that, right. Cause he was challenging my work in general. He was like, I think you're making a mistake. People are going to wish bad luck on you. Like, um, I was going to do it anyway. I was going to do it anyway. I'm going to get free anyway. You know, and if, if, if you ride with me tight, <laughs> like if you don't tight. Yeah. Saw another hand. Hi, Anais. I'm the unofficial president of Myra's uh, fan club. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit more of a technical question, I guess. Um, it's been a secret that the publishing industry is incredibly white, incredibly old. Um, how did you kind of maneuver that situation, especially, I think, at a time when Rudy Sasso's book also came out, and I think there's like that's my book, books. Mama. Yeah, a bunch, <laughs> a bunch of questions that I think like it's like a brother and sister book. They kind of talk about the same things in a lot of different ways, and I haven't had the pleasure of reading your book yet. I'm really excited about, but wanted to know, I guess, what your experience was maneuvering a white publishing. I got to repeat the question. Um, so <laughs> the question is: the publishing industry is very white and old. How did Chris navigate the industry? Um, also referenced Julie Sardis's book, which is like the sister book of Chris's book. Um, but the actual question is navigating the not diverse publishing industry. I've given you all so many books to buy today. Add that to the list. You sound like a white girl, Julie Sardis. Um, she is she has become my my sister, my book mama, my like guru. She's very special uh she's very special she was here she was here <laughs> doing this ago. um yes five percent of books published since 1950 have been published by non-white authors that is an unbelievable five percent that means 95 percent is white i just you know get together get get i really make it clear five percent since 1950 have been by non-white authors. So this alone is a miracle. That's right. Round of applause. Um, and so there's a there's a there's an element of luck, right? Like you break through. I care less about the breaking through. And this is where I need y'all, where we need y'all. We show up with what we watch and what we spend money on and what we invest in. Insert that's bad bunny reference insert bad bunny reference like 
that's it. It's what you invest in. And, and if you want change and you speak about DEI and you speak about this stuff, you can't speak. It's got to be action. It's got to be dollars. It's got to be eyes and attention. You know, so really buy this book, buy Julissa's book, buy these books. And we can begin to turn that five into six into seven, like those little increments matter. They change. This is armor for any young person who's like, I want to write. This is armor. We don't deserve a shelf, like a section. We deserve to be spread throughout like everybody else. Representation matters. How many times we got to say it? You know, so yes, the publishing industry is super white. I have a publisher, Row House, who happens to only publish non-white authors. Uh, and, or tra also traditionally just like not straight white men. Um, and so they're starting, you know, that's their mission is to like raise that percent by one, <laughs> you know, uh, we need more of that, but really as consumers, that's how we do it. We show up with our dollars. Like, and when I say there's more brownness in the world than anything else, I mean it, we got to start acting like it. We have to start demanding how media and publishing and culture, you know, invest in us. And we actually have that power. Like, let's not get it twisted. And we need allies. So buy this book, buy one for your friend, your sister, your cousin, your mama, you know. Yeah. Do we have time for? Oh, uh, online one? Yeah. Which um, one? Um, how can white uh, who relative to white Hey, maybe I could re I'll read yeah. something. Do, do I have to repeat it? Yeah. How do white Latinos who have relative privilege become better allies? That was the question. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. This is from a final note. And I think this answers it. I might be wrong. We'll find out. Valeria. Gracias, oh, Valeria. Valeria. Gracias, Valeria. You know Valeria? Oh, tight. <laughs> Cool. Family time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she got a book too? That's six books y'all gotta buy. I hope you showed up. You got checks on Friday, right? You spent it all here. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six books. <laughs> this, this guy's great. I'm gonna have him in every week. Final note. To all my beautiful brown people, for too long there has existed a whole spectrum of not belonging. Now we take that whole field of color between black and white and make it our spectrum of belonging as well. Yes, sometimes we fall within the cracks and sometimes we still wonder where we belong, but we can always remind ourselves here. I belong here, right here, always here. Without all the shape shifting and pretending, here we are safe to be ourselves. Here we are safe to feel our grief and our hope. Here we can begin to alchemize and embody self-love, liberation and justice. Not in a hoo-woo, hippie, dippy kind of social media way, but an actual we are worthy of self-love and waking up and taking up space and going to bed in peace kind of way. And I don't care what you think kind of way. This new alchemy, this transformation of self-hate into self-love can't happen in a vacuum, and it is much easier said than done. It takes work, community, positive reinforcement, reminders, and sometimes a little help. Valeria, this part's for, for your question. And just because there is a brown body in the room does not mean we cannot perpetuate harmful systems of power as well, or that we are not capable of exclusion. I want us to think more deeply about how we are using our unique privilege gained from being able to sometimes play both sides. Are we committed to anti-racist work in all the spaces, no matter how uncomfortable it may make us? The book of who we are is not a fixed text. It is flowing. It is fluid. It is expansive. It is often brown. We are shaping it right here, right now. I thank you for taking this journey with me, Valeria, everyone else. Much love and many blessings. What an incredible way to end.
Uh, I'll, I'm going to let Chris plug in because there's merch, there's books. How else can we support you? Uh, Ruby Rosa podcast. Listen to it. It's fire. Uh, we, they also, we also turned the book into a podcast called Brown Enough. That's out now. Um, we have really incredible people on there. Uh, and get us, there's merch. What's the website? Uh, if you go to chrisfreeross.com, you'll see everything. You'll see the merch. You'll see the, the podcast. But really, like, we're here for the book. Please support. Show up cop the book i'd love to sign it for you am i we're upstairs here down right here uh and uh and i appreciate each and every one of you and uh if you got any questions that i didn't answer hit me up on social or hit me up right here or something um you're all beautiful thank you thank you all so much there's a book signing and instructions